Okay, so we have recently created um, a new legal entity, the BAMP Foundation for Allograft Pathology, as the structure behind the transplant pathology uh, consensus generating meetings that I organize every two years and have done since 1991. So there's a long, hairy presentation about that. And toward the end, we get to something that might actually interest you, which is what is the future of transplantation and transplant pathology? And one of the attributes of this new foundation is that we sort of buy into what we're doing in this course and, and the idea that one should try to make one's activities relevant to the future. So we incorporate ideas of where transplantation and transplantation pathology is going into the planning of the BAMP Foundation. Now, of course, you're all familiar with Moore's Law, and we talk about it a lot in this course about the exponential change in price performance of computing, and this is what then ultimately leads us to predict that there will be a technological singularity in 2045, and machines will be smarter than we are, and so on and so forth. You've heard that many times. So that's Moore's Law. You spell Moore's law backwards, you get Eram's law. And Eram's law is exactly the opposite. Rather than something increasing very rapidly, it's something that's going down very rapidly. And you can see it at this bottom right of this slide. It's the exponential decline in the number of newly approved drugs by the Food and Drug Administration or Health Protection Canada, compared to billion dollars in R&D expenditure in the pharma area. And it suddenly become almost impossible to afford to do the R&D to create a new drug that will be successfully approved and released. And so this is kind of the opposite. On the one hand, we have this exponential change with a lot of exciting things happening on the technology side. But on the regulatory side, we've almost ground to a halt where no company can afford to put the money into a new drug that would allow it to actually be studied and approved at the, at the end. So what does that mean? Well, we've talked a lot about um, uh, disruptive innovation in this course. For instance, if you take the in inkjet printer, when the first inkjet printer was produced, it was inferior to the laser printer in every way was slower, the, 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 the images weren't quite as sharp. Everything you can imagine that had been a standard for the laser printer, it was inferior. But it was cheaper and it was mass producible, so like everybody on the planet could have an, an inkjet printer. And so now it is the standard. Most of you have your own personal inkjet printer. Pre previously to own your own printer was like unthinkable, you know? Printers were centralized and, and very expensive and met certain standards. So that's disruptive innovation. There are many examples of that where you change the rules. You change the rules, you create something that follows a whole new set of rules and uh, consumer behavior changes. So you can imagine that the behavior of the FDA and Health Protection Canada is going to change in some dramatic way because how can you have a regulatory agency that just stops things so that medicine can't go forward because there can be no new newly approved drugs? Something has, has to happen. But it's a rather complicated thing, isn't it? 
if you think of the, what's preventing you from regularly harming yourself with unapproved therapies, with, with like completely bogus remedies, like, like there used to be, you remember those pictures of bottles of uh, snake oil and other things from like the 1800s? So it used to be possible for any company to make any claim about their therapy and to sell it, and it was a matter of being a good uh, confidence man selling your product. And if you get, get people to buy it, there was a business in it, regardless of whether it was worthless, it did nothing, or actually did harm. A lot of these things did harm. So what prevents you from being damaged by th these bogus therapies? It's uh, the FDA and Health Prote Protection Canada. And you, you actually want that. I, I mean, you may think that your life would be better if there were all these newly released drugs, but actually it, it's, it's good for you that you are protected in this way. So I, I just want you to think of that as the background then. So the Banff Foundation for Allograph Pathology we must remain youthful and relevant for the future, must adapt and plan for changes. As the field changes and stem cell grown organs replace transplantation, then the organization must change with it. There are a lot of theories about what's going to happen in transplantation. And one of them is kind of amusing is the idea of losing its luster. Right now, if you're a transplant surgeon, that's a highly respected profession. And uh, surgeons talk about how they walk with a special sort of bounce in, in, in their steps so you can tell what cool people they are. And it's just really fun to be part of that group. So you can imagine, and this is what these articles talk about, luster being lost, where that bounce in the step is lost a little bit. They start to look not very different from other human beings. And in fact, fewer of the best and brightest young people go into that field. And that seems to be start, starting to happen now. We don't know all, all the reasons, but um, there are fewer people seeking training in uh, transplantation than there used to be. There's less um, uh, commercial money going into the field. Okay, so our organization needs more young people and women, needs enhanced cooperation with other organizations. <laughs> and there is the idea of my alter ego that you may have heard about before. Um, so David Crippen uh, is comparable to me in that he runs um, email discussion groups in critical care medicine like I do in renal medicine, but we're about as different as any two people could possibly be. Um, he has several motorcycles. He's uh, lived sort of on, on the edge. Um, he went to uh, uh, Nepal and stole some religious icons. You know, I mean, we, we've done similar things, but it's turned out differently. Brought back things that were never supposed to leave the country in his uh, uh, Underwear, he was drafted, when, uh, and uh, his girlfriend looked him in, in the eye, told him he was a loser, he got bad grades, he had terrible references, he's the type of person no medical school would ever take, but the University of Georgia, a powerful person there, thought, well, what's the worst that could happen if just once we dipped down and took somebody whose grades and references are lousy, but he seems to have a certain something and we think he might make a good doctor anyway. So they took him. And uh, so he's never won any civilian awards. I've run, won lots of civilian awards. He won lots of awards for bravery when he was in the military in Vietnam. We're about as different. He has his own rock band. I don't. He, uh, so. And, and uh, so we have made a big deal of the, this alter ego-ness. He probably had more fun in the 60s and 70s than I, I did because he did a lot of you know, illegal stuff and he's aging faster than I, I am. So we're, we're trying to sort of 
get people to wrap their head around how the field will change, they're very resistant to this idea of not transplanting organs into anybody for anything in the future and stem cell creation of or organs replacing that. And so we try to get through this resistance by having them shift their mind to think about me and David Crippen and how things would be different. It was David Crippen speaking to you, David Crippen running this course, uh, so on. And uh, that we need to consider changes as different as that when uh, visioning the future of transplantation. Now the spectacular dynamics influencing the pace of stem cell generation, replacing transplantation in the future. This is one of the most intellectually challenging uh, kind of conundrums or, or puzzles or formulas you're ever gonna have to consider. Think of the background that I've given you here. You know, the FDA is ripe for disruptive innovation. Something's gonna happen, there's gonna be a big change. And there's this e rooms law, which, which I just told you about, that suggests that. However, maybe stem cells are the last area that they will give up, the last area where they will loosen the uh, regulatory power that they have because it's the area where more people and higher profile people are being harmed by bogus therapies right now than any other. Whichever is your favorite celebrity, the chances are about 50% that that person who like you really like to follow has gone off to Mexico or China or somewhere to get stem cell ther therapy for something, your favorite sports figures, and it's come back and reported a miraculous cure, you know, without any scientific data. So there are no medical articles supposing, su supporting what these celebrity stories are telling you. And that is just the most ridiculous, unfixable situation. People are so oriented around the lives of famous people that when a famous person does so something, doesn't matter if it has no basis in scientific fact, it influences huge number of people. So they figure if their favorite sports star got the stem cell therapy to fix his arm or leg or something, they want to do the same thing. So there's more and more of the stem cell tourism and people are really being harmed physically and financially by this. It's probably the, this stem cell tourism now is the biggest area where the FDA and Health Protection Canada are standing in the way of, of many more people being harmed. And so I think there might be a simple argument that stem cells are stem cells and they might loosen regulations in almost every other area so that some drugs get through the pipeline without spending hundreds of billions of dollars on, on them but maybe stem cells won't be the area. But we're facing a, a really curious situation. By about 2020, the science will be there to create human organs from stem cells. And then how long will it take for the regulatory side to catch up? It could be 20, 30 years. I honestly don't know. Um, it, it's such a mess now. And so it, it's hard if, if we were just one parameter, when will the science be ready? It's possible to predict that, but there are just too many variables, too many unknowns here to really know. Um, so we can be confident that medicine will change in this way, that there'll come a time when Transplantation as we know it to now will cease. That doesn't mean that what transplant surgeons and transplant physicians and transplant pathologists do will be worthless because stem cell created organs, you might say that your assumption would be they'd be completely normal. But actually, if you think of you know normal embryogenesis versus creating something 
in an artificial way, there are lots of things that can happen so that certain components are left out. For instance, in the kidney, commonly stem cell created kidneys are missing the loop of Henle. Well, without the loop of Henle, you can't concentrate the urine. So if I put an otherwise normal kidney into you that's missing loops of Henle, you'd pee out all your body water in an hour and be dead, right? That wouldn't be a, a good thing, e even though the, the kidney would otherwise function perfectly. So, so there are many potential uh, abnormal changes that could still exist in stem cell uh, created organs. So there's, we still need people to look into that, and there would still be a role for uh, some of the current skills. Anyway, um, that is basically what I wanted to tell you about, because I, I think it, it's a logical expectation that you would learn about stem cells in this course, and you probably, one way or the other, are learning about them. But I, I think it's really hard to come to one conclusion at the moment. It, it, it's, it's really hard to predict what will happen. But if you check on the science, there's new stuff happening almost every week. There, in uh, animal species, there are more different organs that are becoming possible to create from stem cells in animals. All the barriers to doing this in people seem to be falling rather rapidly, and so we're, we're hurtling toward a future where there'd be no shortage of organs at all. And a lot of organs we don't transplant today, you, you could have any organ, if there's an organ you need, <laughs> you can have it. There would be no shortage, and it would be very different from the medicine of today. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. Any questions about that? <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> why, why don't you, you know what I found very stimulatory? Take the microphone off and, and start passing it down the aisle and somebody <laughs> will speak. I've, I've noticed that. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon. Yeah, somebody will speak. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe address the current status of the ethical issues in stem cells and where you see that transpiring in the near future. The, the current status of what? Well, the ethical issues regarding stem cells. I know a lot of people have problems with sourcing it or you know, where it might be coming from. Um, you mean the uh, ethical issues around uh, stem cells? Was that what you said? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the 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 ethical issues around uh, embryonic stem cells um, are obvious because it relates to you know uh, uh, aborted fetuses. That 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 is the main origin, but. More and more, there are adult stem cells, stem cells that you can obtain in other ways that you can reprogram, so they become pluripotent, just, just like the, the uh, uh, embryonic ones. So yes, it, it's, a, it's a problem, but it's not much of a barrier at the moment to stem cell things in general because I'm not recommending that you do this, but if you go on you know, celebrity sites and, and you know, do like sports figures, stem cells, you'll get hundreds of hits, all different people, or you know, Hollywood celebrities, stem cells. So it, it's a very active thing now, and, and you're right that there are uh, ethical barriers, but uh, I think they'll be rapidly overcome and in, in a way that satisfies people with almost all uh, religious backgrounds. So um, I was wondering if we can make a kidney out of stem cells and if those ones being made from stem cells just happen to be missing this loop of Henle, why can't we use stem cells to make a loop of Henle? 
No, no, we, I think made properly, stem cells um, create kidneys that have uh, loop, loops of energy. It has to do with cell density and the dynamics and stuff like that. Um, and if you're saying, why couldn't you take a kidney lacking loops of Henle and insert stem cells and, and have that? Well, once the rest of the kidney's made, it's, 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 the tubular system would be completely connected. The, there's no space left for the loops of Henle that should be there. Yes? Uh, I'm just going to ask. Uh how these stem cell made organs are actually made? Because I'm, I'm not that familiar with the literature that's out there these days with new ways of making organs. Um, when you talk about the loop of Henley being missing from these organs, like, what, 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 what are the ways in general these organs are made from stem cells? So you decellularize the organ. So you, say you, you take a heart that's got uh, muscle cells and fibrous tissue and uh, uh, endothelium, blood vessels in it. You remove all the cells so that the fiber structure is left. And then you repopulate that now completely white, I mean, <laughs> a beautiful ghost-like uh, representation of a heart. But it's missing all the muscle cells and everything. It just has the, the sort of uh, background structure and then you put stem cells in there and they uh, proliferate and they sense from where they end up what they should turn into. So you, it sounds like magic. The, the magic doesn't work perfectly. Right now in stem cell grown hearts, they seem to have all the right cells in all the right places, but they don't beat as hard and as vigorously as a normal heart. And we don't really know why. I'm sure it's a fixable problem. But it, it's really interesting <laughs> that you get it. So it looks perfect. Everything's there, but it's sort of, uh, you know, not, not, it's like a heart that doesn't have the proper uh, muscular tone or, or something. But otherwise, yeah, so that's how it works. You, you take a structure remove all its cells and then put in new cells and they repopulate. And, and they can be your own stem cells, so it's genetically identical to you, so it will not reject. I have another question. Uh, say our work with stem cells somehow fails, that so we, we can't make these perfect organs that we can transplant in the future. They, do you feel as a pathologist uh, there, there's any future for, let's say, artificially made um, organs. I say the me mechanical heart, mechanical pancreas with the enzymes required to make insulin. Like, so something in more of a technological route, that, in that yeah. sense? Well, I think the, the unknowns about what the body does um, continue to sort of confound that. Um, do we know everything that the kidney does and do we know how to make a machine that does everything? Generally, that, that hasn't been the approach. There's something called the bio-artificial kidney. We combine sort of a dialysis membrane and then a layer of growing tubular cells in, in kind of a, a monolayer. So it, it combines the pure technology side with uh, uh, Biology, that has generally been, been the approach because it's so hard to figure out all the functions that you need to replace and exactly how you would do that, whereas the cells already know. So, so it's simpler to, to, to put in cells that already know what to do rather than relying on designing you know, a machine to carry out every function that the normal kidney uh, carries out. That's just a harder challenge. It's, it's not impossible. Um, I can tell you a funny story. So the, the bio-artificial kidney, um, the first 
guy to give a lecture about this. It, it was at a plenary session at a big uh, uh, kidney meeting, thousands of people there in the largest room. And uh, it, it was clear what this was about. It was about, as you say, an artificial kidney with the combining sort of growing cells with the dialysis membrane to replace all functions of the kidney. And there's no other competing session, but as it got closer to the time for this guy to speak, everybody seemed to be looking at their watch and decided they needed to leave the room. When he actually spoke, I was just about the only person there. It shows you sometimes the resistance to new ideas, particularly when you're in a for-profit circumstance where you benefit from things staying the way they are and you really don't want to hear about some new thing that's going to upturn the apple cart so, so that your whole financial source of being is, is just you know, you know, not uh, predictable anymore. So I asked him what he thought happened. <laughs> he said, they're not ready. I'm ready, but they're, they're not ready. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I was wondering, how does one test the integrity of a uh, stem cell organ once it's made. I'm, I'm assuming you don't just put it in the patient and wait to see what happens. <laughs> no, I, I think it would be similar to now, but it would be a, a fascinating challenge. You know, uh, a biopsy now, like when I look at a piece of, of, of kidney from a transplanted organ, I'm looking for diseases and I'm looking for rejection. I'm, I'm not looking for the idea that it's pretty normal but there's something missing, but I think that's what we, 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 we will have a whole new category of uh, thing that a uh, transplant or, you know, that a solid organ uh, pathologist needs to look for, and that is, is everything there? You know, is it, is, is it, are all the, the parts of the organ present? Is it normally structured? So I, I would imagine that there'll be a period of time at least where we will be taking small pieces of these stem cell grown organs and examining them under the microscope to make sure everything's there. They, they would, cause them to function normally. You could also do functional tests to some extent. Before you put them in, you can look at, you know, the urine coming out from the ureter and that sort of, there, there are various tests that you could imagine doing. So you could combine looking at structure and looking at uh, function so that you don't go through an operation and just make everything worse for the patient by putting in an organ that does all the wrong things. Yeah. So any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious if you have any idea of which organs we won't be able to um, treat with stem cell replacements or what are the limits basically of yeah. this type of Well, I, I think cells. let's think about disseminated uh, diseases of the nervous system, for instance, diseases that affect every nerve in all parts of the body. I guess there, stem cells by themselves wouldn't necessarily fix things. But you could imagine that some sort of nanobot, you know, not the nanobots of today, but the nanobots like the, the, those uh, uh, fictional nanobots that can do all sorts of amazing things, you know, that could home to nerves and specifically give these abnormal nerves what they need somehow. So I, I think that might be one of the most challenging things is truly systemic diseases like that, uh, sort of fixing everything in all parts, parts of the body. Uh, that, that, that's a lot harder than a single or organ which has failed. But I, I, I still, still think it's possible. And then what about uh, aging itself, you know, and, and you know, fixing the skin 
that sort of thing. Fixing the hair. Uh, so I, I think all, all that is possible, ultimately. Uh, it's, it's not stem cells necessarily that will do that. It's sort of genetic reprogramming, I guess. Um, more the kind of thing that uh, uh, David Pierce is, is uh, talking about. I don't think there's any medical condition that we would want to change that is not potentially treatable by these uh, therapies in the future. Uh, so, any other questions? Wow, I, I thought there was a, like totally fail, but this is, this is as good as a lecture that I had prepared, maybe. Yeah. I'm just curious about uh, what you said about stem cell growing parts. You said uh, a cat can eat as fast as all the parts, so a cat um, has as much blood like, per second, I guess. Right. What are like, the health implications of that? Like, do you no, I, I think it's simple, really, that. This is just a you know, temporary problem. Maybe it is what you get when you create an organ like the heart where there's no pressure inside as you're uh, creating it. So it doesn't have any work to do until you're finished. Whereas in the normal situation, you know, the heart starts to beat in the first few days of life, and as it grows, it, it's, it's always doing its thing. There's always pressure inside, and it has work to do. So I, I think that's probably all it would take. You need to create a heart in a situation where, while it's being created, it's actually working. It's actually doing stuff. There's actually pressure inside the heart chambers, all, all the things that exist in life. And then I think you would probably get a heart that's uh, vigorous and a able to do everything that a regular heart would be able to do. So yeah, I mean, such a heart would be prone to, to uh, heart failure and just wouldn't lead to a very fun life because every time you wanted to do anything to you know, exert yourself, you'd get like really tired. So yeah, but, but uh, I, I'm sure it's, Fixable. Really, every problem we have with stem cell generated organs at the moment, you can imagine that those problems will be fixed in the next few years. So we're very close to a point where if we could overcome the uh, regulatory barriers, we, we could routinely use uh, stem cell generated organs. <clears throat> I have a question about how long these stem cell generated organs can last. Um, do they have the potential for uh, sort of being functional as long, uh, as long as a normal, well-functioning organ? Because I, I know with some techniques like cloning, the clones that come out from animals are usually show signs of advanced aging in the, their yeah. organs. I, I don't know if, if the rates of telomere shortening have, have, has been studied. So, I mean, that, that's one aspect of um, whether it, it, these would have a normal lifespan. Um, I, I don't know that for sure, but that would be a fixable problem too. It's just another, you know, a parameter. If you find out that the uh, uh, telomeres are shortening abnormally fast, then you just need to figure out how to, how to change that. It, it, it's not a permanent problem. Everything's fixable, I think. So, yeah. And you talked a bit about the FDA regulations, how they're getting tighter. Do you have any idea of what kind of corporate uh, interests are lobbying for some of the are there, are there any corporate interests uh, lobbying for tighter regulation? Because you mentioned the for-profit sector benefiting from the current technologies and the lack of change. I was wondering if there's been any news of just corporate tampering in FDA operations. Well, it, I guess I have sort of a skewed view of it because the corporate uh, investment 
in the field that I'm in has, has been consistently going down like the last 10 years and big pharma companies like uh, Roche, uh, for instance, are basically getting out of that area. Roche is, is no longer a player in the uh, transplantation field. I think it's a problem that goes beyond uh, corporate lobbying because corporations, particularly pharmaceutical uh, corporations, now have a bit of a PR problem. You you would be you know aware of that. So, if the only entity arguing that the the FDA needs to change was big pharma, I don't think anything would change because people sort of. Yeah, various you know conspiracy theories about <laughs> big pharma being the bad guy, but I think a lot of ordinary people and a lot of people with orphan you know diseases, diseases that affect very small numbers of of people, they also feel that something needs to change. There needs to be a way to get drugs to the market without these extraordinary costs and and long time periods and many, many failures of, of drugs where you spend years and years and then it's not you know, approved at the end. Um, so I, I think lobbying by ordinary people will have an effect and that's probably, the, if, if you think of the thing that caused the inkjet printer to come out ahead of the laser printer, it, it wasn't, you know, corporations, it was people like you who went out and bought the inkjet printer and said, this is just fine, you know. This may not be quite as sharp as the laser jet, but I like it, so, yeah. Oh, speaking of the la laser jet, that, that leads into my next question. Um, in, in terms of the stem cell organs, uh, what, what, what is the accessibility like for this type of treatment? Because as we know, with all new treatments, there's usually barriers um, from, from government uh, providing the care to the patients who need it? It yeah, takes well, a long time to approve it. I, I, I think we, we don't know, but everything we've talked about in this course would conceivably apply. You know, uh, elitism, uh, the, the idea that uh, new technologies benefit only the rich or only people in rich countries, and then uh, speciesism, right? I mean, is this only gonna benefit uh, human beings? What, what about uh, sentient uh, higher animals? Should we do the same for elephants, horses, you know, and then pets and so on? Where, where, do, where does it end? I, I, I can't really answer that, but you can imagine all sorts of uh, uh, scenarios, for instance, a, a, a particularly plausible one would be that it's widely accessible to people in uh, developed countries, and it's it's accessible to very rich people for their pets and everything else. You know that that if they're they're able to pay, they they can get or organs for the dogs and cats and everything else. It 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 it. Um, yeah, so that that's sort of what I what I think. But you know, we need the uh, Earl Waz of the world to to be raising these uh, uh, ethical issues. They're always there, and you, you you can imagine things that make life and health a lot better for us could actually make. Um, illness much harder to bear in the poorest uh, uh, countries of the world. So, you know, it, 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 it's kind of good all, always. I think uh, Bibiana Kujak is, is talking about that this uh, coming week. So it would be nice to think that uh, technology advances health for everybody, not just people in, in wealthy uh, countries. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry that, that Jack uh, didn't come, but he, so the deal was, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of interesting. 
So we did peer review with the top five lecturers last term and got people to tell us what they uh, recommended be, because you, you can get sort of stuck if, if you're very proud of what you're doing and you, you en enter into all this sort of self-praising stuff and you never get any better. So we thought by going outside, we would get ideas of ways to further improve even the best parts of the course. And the peer reviewers said that they thought Jack's lecture was trying to, come, to pack too much into one lecture. So we'd make it into two. So that had been the idea, but now you see it's going to be packed back into one again. So life has all these funny twists and, and turns. So maybe it will be two lectures next term, but I don't think it'll be two lectures this term because of what happened today. Okay, well, thank you very much for putting up with the unpredictability and surprises that were part of today. So we have six people for rich man, poor man. There's still four seats out there for remaining students if you are interested and and your friends. Okay, thank thank you very much. That's it for today. <clears throat>